for me to start with our introductions, I thought we got a small group tonight because it's the middle of summer. Um, so we'll start with our introductions. I'm Jesse Smathers, I'm Basie's Technical Director of Smoky, and we'll move to my right. James Clay, our family member. Price Story, Story with Harms, and a uh, family member. Tony Kitt, Open Arts Art Center. James Lindsay, I'm Daria. Hi, Mary Short and Katie Short. I'm John Frazier, IDD Care Coordination Manager for the Central Region. And I'm Tina Clark, the IDD Care Coordination Manager for the Northern Region. And that's it here in Lenore. Thanks, everyone. Uh, on the agenda, we have uh, a review of the uh, agenda minutes. And everyone should have a copy of the minutes. Uh, James is going to talk about the CAP C program. And uh, then we'll do some discussion regarding the waiver updates. Uh, so I guess we'll start by going through the uh, minutes. Or is there anything that anyone would like to add to the agenda? Okay. We'll move uh, on to the minutes. Let's see the first item that's mentioned in the minutes that I'd send a PDF for the monitoring tool to the care coordination, or used by care coordination to participants, and I did send that email. Uh, and uh, I also sent several emails regarding notification that the uh, <coughs> waiver's been posted for public comment. We'll probably we'll talk more about that near the end of the meeting. That document is posted uh, July 12th, and it will be available until July 13th at midnight. June 12th. You said July 12th. Yeah, I'm sorry. June 12th, and it'll be available until July um, 13th at midnight. And. Um, but then also, at the last meeting, there was a request to have a, a presentation, or it's come up at a couple of meetings, to have a presentation.
information about the cardinal settlement regarding resource allocation and language and such. Uh, Tracy Hayes has agreed to do that, and she will do it at the meeting on August 24th. So, so that's on the agenda for August 24th is a review of the settlement regarding the waiver. Okay. So, James? That's, that, that sums up the minutes and the action items. Now we'll move on to your presentation about CAP seed. So I was asking about the children CAP seed, um, which is another Medicaid waiver serving birth through age 21. Um, a lot of similarities with innovations as far as how you access um, income requirements and we need to go there. It's a pretty easy process. Right now we answer directly to DMA, case management agencies. Um, families can call a case management agency and request a referral. The agency is able to do those online. Uh, we're able to do, do them in about 10, 15 minute phone call. And what we're looking at is um, potential eligibility. Um, kind of like the old MR2. The kids must have a diagnosis, a medical diagnosis, um, and need help in three out of six activities of daily living. Um, the biggest change, I think, from when 10 years ago, from when I used to remember of CAP C, everybody thought you had to have this really intense medical need. That's not the case. We can have children from three on up that have, let's say, cerebral palsy. And all they need is AIDS, and they, they, and they need help with the activities that they were living, bathing, dressing, toileting. Those kids qualify for Cap C. Um, so that is at the lowest levels, personal care. So that's something to keep in mind. Under age three, they're really looking for medical needs. Um, the, the DMA world, Medicaid, three is that magical age where you can get diapers. Because um, they expect typical kids are able to do things for themselves. So when you're looking at birth to three, we have to look for medical interventions, whether it's um, oxygen assessments, um, <coughs> the NG tubes so of tube treating through the nose, um, ventilators. After you hit age three, again, we look at really the activities of daily living. Um, Age isn't a matter. We have people that have come through at age 18 that were in car accidents, traumatic <coughs> brain injury, they qualify for Cap C. Um, and then when they turn uh, turning 21, in one particular case, they qualify for innovations. So we work with smart getting transition. Um, Do they always qualify or they have to meet the same criteria? They have to meet the criteria for innovations. Um, we do have people who are aging out whose needs far exceed the cost. So they have needs that are $250,000 a year. They get our ventilators, um, 18 hours a day of RN, $36 an hour rate. So they don't qualify just for the cost. They qualify for all the other reasons. Um, it's pretty black and white as far as what we can do. Uh, we have maximum, let's say, of 720 hours of respite. But not everybody gets it. Um, it's based on four miles. Um, they, we have three levels of nursing. We have a CNA-1, which is people who just require personal care needs, CNA-2, which typically kids that are being too fed. And then our skill, which is the highest level, which are the kids that require active assessment every, every two hours. And we have an assessment tool that helps determine those levels. Um, once we start the process of referral, we would take right now about three weeks to get referrals approved by DMA. Um, once they're approved, the, and the case management agency is notified, and they start the process starting with an FL2. Um, an FL2 is similar to the MR2. The FL2 is used to determine eligibility for nursing facilities versus the ICF facilities. 
um, that is completed by the doctor and that is submitted to the NCHAX. That is as of today, um, like innovations, CAPC is going through a waiver change and that's going to be changing probably in the fall. Um, so we're talking about a process that's going to change, but actually will get faster. Um, I didn't know anything got faster. <laughs> actually, the, our process got slow in the last eight months. It's been, you know, you want to get your head up against the wall. Um, but we're going to be able to submit things uh, electronically that are already signed by the doctor come fall. Um, and we'll know within a couple of minutes if the child's eligible. So it's going to be scored on an electronic record. Do you have some specific agencies that provide services? There's, yes. Um, it just depends on the county. But it's all nursing agencies. So the case managers, some agents, most of the agent counties have at least two case managing agencies. Um, it's just you have to look at the different counties because we all get assigned. Direct, direct care. For the direct care, we have, in this region, we have about six, between six and eight. Um, like Bayada. Bayada, Maxim, A New Hope, some real smaller ones for me. The issue we're having is finding CNAs, CNA twos, and even nurses. Um, that is a real shortage. Um, and it's really hard because we do have young ones that are coming out of hospitals, um, little babies that are trying to get them in care. Once, I don't want to speak my agents, once we start the assessment, it's about four weeks from the time, actually it's about two weeks from the time we start the assessment to the time we submit it. Um, we try to turn around pretty fast, but we have up to four months to complete the process. So you approve and then you finish your referral to the plan. We, we do the assessment, we complete a plan that's pretty easy. Uh, it all gets submitted electronically and it's reviewed in Raleigh by a nurse. Once it's approved, we authorize to the agency of choice. And then we do typical case management, monitoring, coordinating, linking them up. Um, come fall, that process gets easier as case management agencies will be doing local approval. So, um, for me, I'm going back to <laughs> the late 1990s um, with a lot of things. So, being able to approve things locally means we don't have to wait a month to six months for reviews. Um, we'll have a 10 day expected turnaround, I believe. Um, cap choice, which is self determination, and Cap children and Cap DA will come online in the fall, is what we're being told. So. You said local approval, is that you? That'll be me. Okay. And my agency. Each agency will have to have somebody assigned. Each case management agency will have somebody assigned. If somebody doesn't qualify for innovation, they should try Cap C. If they don't qualify, and. I mean, you know, if they're on the list, and they don't wait so long. If they're on the list, they can call. Um, the minimum amount of hours somebody will receive is 20 hours a week. That's minimum. What's the maximum budget? Is the maximum, maximum budget is 250000 Now, it's, everything is black and white here. So I would say a child who just needs help with personal care and has an available caregiver. Mom or dad does not work, they're in the home. They may receive 20 hours a week. And that's it. That's the, that's the max plus respite. Mom or dad, single parent, maybe parents, they're working 40 hours a week, they will be able to receive the 20 hours of what we call personal time plus up to an additional 50 hours for work because it's not an available caregiver. For our children, teenagers who require active assessment every two hours on ventilators, oxygen, we have one child who has severe diabetes and must be tested every two hours and blood sugar. Um, those kids can receive an additional 56 hours per week. Again, it's all it's all written in stone, so there's not, well, I need 80, sorry, this is the limit. So it's both an hourly basis and a an, budget basis? The max is 250000 a year, but we do have the hourly. The typical kids that make it near the max are the ones that are requiring 24 hour a day coverage for two weeks. Um, we do have that available, we call short-term intensive. 
So for the kids coming out, um, like I said, the one right now we're working with, maybe month old coming out, we'll have 24 hour kid day care for seven for 14 days coming out of the hospital. Uh, we do have kids that typically typically will go into the NICU unit, and the doctor will order 24/7 care for two weeks, and that's how we get up to that maximum amount. Um, and then respite again, the respite ranges from the, the least amount is 180 hours a year up to 720. Um, we're also huh. filled in for a summer schedule for the kids who have parents that are working. Uh, so we have that flexibility to build that in. There's also vehicle home modifications, caregiver training. Um, unfortunately, we do not have technology yet. Um, I'm hoping oh. they will come to that conclusion that it can save some money by putting that in. Well, you can get it from the You can get it from the and, and we do try to work closely with the VR and um, make them living for things that go over our limits. So, so like the bare minimum that someone is going to receive is typically 20 hours a week. Someone yes. whose parents are working could receive 70 hours a week. And uh, folks that are requiring that active assessment could get another 56 hours a week. Sleep hours. Of that. Yes. So yeah, we do have the kids who are on ventilators, mm -hmm. parents are sleeping, they need to sleep, and that's where we kind of we get the 56 hours a week. Um, so then again, those are pretty hard, hard, tar hard targets. There's no flexibility there, so it's really easy to talk with family saying, "This is what we can do." You got medical, you got medical orders, and that's why it's so hard to pass. And. Uh, the service is typically personal care? Well, the service depends on the individual. Um, our service levels are set by the Board of Nursing. So the Board of Nursing determines what a CNA 1, a CNA 2 can do, and what a nurse can do. The biggest problem we really run into is that unlike the innovations, a CNA 1 and a CNA 2 cannot give medications. And the only way if a child gets regular time medications, they get the same med three times a day, that doesn't get them skilled nursing. And only an RN they'll be able to do that. If a child is getting a PRN medication five, six, seven days a week, they can get that skill level. So that's the biggest hardship we run into. Yeah, we gotta be assessed for the PRN. Um, He's right to orders to say PRN, and I check it every <laughs> I'm not saying it doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm not saying it should happen. Now, with choice, that will change um, because once we make the self determination, the families will be employee of record, or can choose that, and they can hire people that are not CNAs, not CNA2s, and those individuals can get medications. So we see that as going to be a real big benefit. The downside I see is I can hire a grandma who's not a nurse. And if my child is going here and that's 36 bucks an hour, and the state is going to pay $36 an hour for somebody at the high school department. Hmm. Thank to you. Provide. $36. If the child meets that skill level of care, that child will be able to that rate. The should also meet that skill level. It's not required. Under choice. Hmm. So, and there's lack of nurses. That's correct. Um, our biggest hardship right now is finding nurses to cover sleep hours for our providers. And so, and hospitals are paying $30, $35 an hour, and providers get 30 cents. So, I think a cat choice is going to be a boom um, for, for families. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. I get concerns about people not being nurses. submitted probably six people to the Board of Nursing. Um, CNAs and nurses cannot leave kids alone. The statute 
And I have gone up to many a home and people have been outside smoking a cigarette. They violate the statute and we report. So it is a good program. It is something that if we have, if there's people that are waiting, I will not say autism is a, the worst phone calls I get. I get parents and the child, the child has autism and a seizure disorder and they have one, a seizure a month. And there's nothing we can do. Um, they're not going to fall apart. Kids with Down syndrome, and that's all that's happening, are not going to qualify. And that's hard. Um, but that's not to say we do have several kids with autism who are receiving CAP C. Um, and, and we've had some with the mitochondrial Lee syndrome. That's a muscle syndrome. And what happens is your muscles deteriorate. Some of the muscular dystrophy. Um, and we were able to show that the issue wasn't the autism, which I personally don't see it. They had some of the issue, and we were able to show that the issue wasn't the autism when we laid out the diagnoses. You know, like there's no more DSM, there's no more like, access 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You put the top one, we put the autism at the very bottom, and, and we select the metal. Mm. We can. Um, so we try. I've had uh, red syndrome get approved. I've had it get the light. <coughs> so we need to prove they get to the light and they get to the pill and the light. So um, what I always tell people is I'd rather take a 10-minute phone call and ask a bunch of questions and families will say, why are you asking this? Because i got to get to what the information is. Um, and the other thing that used to be the rumor years ago is, well, if you get Cap C, you can't get Cap and YBD. Well, that's not true either. You can have Cap C, and if they're not on the registry, um, we I am contacting Captain now and letting them know, hey, I got this kid, this child I just called. I think they qualify for innovations. Can you put them on the registry? And we're trying to do that to help families out, so they don't want to call Spunky and go through that one. We can do it for them. So you can be on Cap C and be on the registry. And mm -hmm. if the child's name does come up in an innovation slot, we work with Smokey and with the families to help them make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in that situation now, we've had one child in the past that was given an innovation slot, and we worked with, well, at that time, Western Highlands, so that we could do an assessment, determine what level, and that family chose to do Cap C, because they gave them a high school person. And we're doing that now. So we want to make sure the kids go on the right program. And we want to make sure all the resources we have are, are used. All right. And the other big thing is unlike innovation, there is no wait list. The only way there's a wait list is, is if a case management agency creates one. And if they do, the inmate's going to give them another one. So. They should never run into a weightless issue for Cap C. Um, ever. And that's real important. Can't do anything about our staffing issues or our provider staffing issues. So, um, what count do you serve, James? I serve six out of the eight, I guess, Legacy County. So we, we're not officially in Rutherford. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not officially in Rutherford and Mitchell County. We do have kids in both those counties. Um, so if we get somebody that calls us, um, we did with one of those counties and says, no, no, we want you, our friend says, we'll find a way to get serve them. But if somebody calls one of our those counties, um, we go out east to Burke um, and McDowell. And then the western region, we cover all the counties except for Cherokee and Clay. Why are you not red? At the time, when we started there in Cap C, we picked it up from uh, friends, was it Mentor? Yeah. Friends Together Mentor. And they weren't covering those counties. Um, and then we had a, a family move there from here. And they were like, no, we want to keep you. And so we did. But at the time, we didn't request to be added. But now, if we request to be added because of the waiting changes, they won't do it. Uh, but as an agency, I can say, please add me to Redford County. 
But if a family calls me and says, I live in Polk County, when I make the referral call, I just live in Polk County, wherever they live. But we've had probably about four kids move to Rutherford, and we've had two, you know, from other counties, and we've had two, both families, two, and we've had kids that have been in Michigan that moved back home to Mitchell County, so we've got about four kids there. Uh, we have one child at Murphy, and I was supposed to provide her, beg me to do it. And I'm like, I went to go out there one, and I had a new case manager come down and said, cover this family. Uh, we turned down for one child in Cherokee. How many, uh, how many folks do y'all serve? We're serving about 145, and we have six case managers, and two nurses, seven case managers, and two nurses. Yeah, we kind of nice. put people out, so we have people assigned. We have a couple of case managers now covering McDowell and some other counties. We have a couple down south, so we're trying to keep people in the locations they know. All the case managers we have have five years or more experience. Um, they've all done, actually, the Captain YDD waiver. Um, one of my nurses was a case manager with skill creations. <laughs> Years ago, and the other one has 30 years experience. Um, and for the most part, we don't lose anybody. Um, now that's 145, and you're actually getting better since. Because you were saying that we have, we have about 145, and we have 10 right now that are in process. We have that are sitting in the waiting No, we have six that are in review, initial plans in Raleigh. So, I mean, it just depends on where they're at. I so, get that case. Oh, how many, how many? People that are qualified that went on getting services. Oh, man. Out of the night, All the money is served that we services. No, not all. We, we have some places that are very rural that well, we can't get to. Services, but they are not. So, we, we probably have about four or five that are. Not even that many that are not getting services, but it's because we don't where they live. They, we can't find, or well, the agencies can't find one. That's all for that? Yeah. We probably got about 30% who are getting all their services. What happened about 30%? Yeah, they're getting most, but they're getting half. But again, is that if I could walk into an agency, they ought it, and I can see them all and see all the office spaces they got over there. With, and they're one agency that won't take new referrals right now because they don't have the staff for what they have. Uh, it's just a severe shortage. You only get your service of case management. They don't get anything from smoking, no care coordination. They may get some mental health services. Okay. So, you know, we've really watched that. So, um, we do have kids with behavior, so they need to have the psychiatrist. Um, we have some kids that really want ABA, which is not available. Um, but we try to work, especially with the few that have autism. But we will hook up with Smokey um, if somebody needs something. And it's a struggle because trying to get mental health providers to understand, yes, yeah, you have to serve these kids. Um, in the past, I don't know how big it is now. When they turn age 20, I, I can run a report and tell you five years out how many kids are turning age 20. And we get in touch, we start probably about a year out saying, hey, Jesse, when I be, hey, Kathy, I got this child turning 20, let's start talking. Smokey now has a process in place. Um, I'm running across time, so my case manager and I can't run into working together to get that person transition to I1, because they can't lapse. They, they, they have to go from one waiver to the other waiver, whether it's Innovation in this case, we have kids that caught the on rental aids, they cost way too much money for innovation or cap EA, so those will transition into private duty nursing. Uh, Medicaid service or we'll transition to cap EA if they don't qualify for the other two. What is cap EA? That is, it's personal care level, CNA 1 or 2. Does it still do the same thing as cap city? For adults, but with a lot less, it's about $3,000 a month. And services. Mm -hmm. So what is and all the services have to be in the home. Yes. What happens to the friends like you know what I'm talking about? 
throw this so hot? I'm trying to think who. Uh, like she she would, that, that, that person, somebody like that, would have to go to the private university. Okay. And she can't get her services while she's at school. That's um, a whole other issue. Okay. That's, this is I think she's local. That's good. Does, does anyone in Boone have any questions for James? Give you a chance to. Sure. You got any questions, Ron? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, hey, James, you're up there. Amen. I've been heading to the Rockets a long time. It's been a while, man. Yeah, doesn't um, the Rockets look great? Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Uh, Can't see him on camera. Kind of the, uh, I think you alluded to it. When they age out and cast scene, are they, uh, are they guaranteed any emergent slot or eligible? slots in reserve for children transitioning out of CAP City and the child has to make the, uh, well actually they're becoming an adult, they have to make, make the eligibility requirements for NC Innovations and then they're transitioned into Innovations on their birthday, on their 21st birthday, on the first day of the birthday month. Right? Uh, well, we're getting some debates on that from the SAS <laughs> uh, can't You can't change the indicator at all. But, uh, we, Actually, she can with overrides. Can she? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with the new system. That's what I think. Yeah. Because I was under the same thing. But, 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 uh, I did a deeper call. Yeah. 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 My thing is, like, well, uh, no mess up. But, uh, yeah, so, so we, we have slots in reserve for children that are aging out, coming adults, and need innovations. And uh, James does work with us about those individuals. Like we've done, we've had three this year. We had three H and F, but only one qualified. For yeah. Well, well, I'm thinking so we had a couple from another Tennessee okay. set uh, up in Avery County. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that's what happens on the transition from Cap C or from Cap C to Innovations. And we do when they come up on the registry. Well, that's coming up now. We've got a few, uh, yeah. some people that are receiving Cap C and on the first come, first serve list, their name's up because they were referred to the list about the same time they were referred to Cap C. Uh, and they're being, they're discussing whether or not they're going to stay with Cap C or move to innovations. Yeah, and Roger, that really comes down to agencies working with the MCOs. So it's lucky I, I do have that relationship and do understand innovations um, to make that transition easier and also make it easier for families um, and having bilingual staff in, in one case right now is pretty critical. Um, but we always try to let them know a year ahead it, um, so they know, hopefully, if we only get, don't have any kids aging out, they should be able to take those slots and use them elsewhere, hopefully. Um, so. In some of the counties, it's Footprints Case Management out of Mecklenburg. Um, up in the northern counties, it's Geneva Home Care. They're up in Avery, Matauga, Mitchell, and I think Footprints is, Footprints is up there out of Mecklenburg. And then Cherokee and Clay is just Good Shepherd. They're the only agency out that far. There's a, on the, yeah, there's on the CAPC website, there's a um, case management agency by county. Hey, 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 hey. Their care. 
and then after age three, they're usually independent for the typical child. Now, if I got a nephew that's three and a half, was three and a half before we got toilet trained, and my boy's three and a half, and he's going to be toilet trained probably in about two months. So you're looking at the middle of the road. That's how they determine diapers too. Medicaid won't pay for diapers until they turn three. The day they turn three, Medicaid pays for it. They look at two feet under age three as similar to feeding by mouth. But if you have the NG, the nasal gastro tube, that is not. I mean, that's a more involved, difficult feeding. And that's actually something we have to have a nurse to do. Mm -hmm. So looking at under age three, we're really looking closely at medical needs. Um, and it's hard. To do. It's not hard. We're working with the baby right now. And if you ask for the diagnosis, I can't tell you. But at three weeks old, she hit the arm and she broke it at three places. Um, this baby came out with every rib broken, skull fracture. Uh, it's something that impacted. Um, shoot me, I can't remember. Um, and she has the NG2 and PRN medications. And that baby, even if she didn't have the PRN medications, qualifies because she requires two people for everything. If they transfer the baby, they pick the baby up and they move it to somebody's lap, it's a two person. If they change the baby, it's two people. Feed the baby, it's two people. She has a specialized car seat mattress. She is a beautiful little baby, and they've been told to treat her like a normal child. Um, and she's going through some experimental stuff um, that's all being done in North Carolina. But so there's not a black and white here. Okay. Again, it's really worth picking up the phone and calling and letting us see the control. It's still medical before age three. It has to be medical for age three. And like I said, when you see that with this child, um, I, 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 after, age three, after age three, we're looking for the medical diagnosis. You're still looking for medical. You gotta have the medical diagnosis. Yeah. And the three out of six areas we can't remember. This the three out of six. It's uh, self care, receptive, and expressive language. Mm -hmm. This language in the yeah, learning. No, that's yours. Yeah, that's just my Okay. So walking, it's walking, dressing, bathing, toileting, and communication. Okay, let's see if anyone have anything, comments or questions in Lenore? No, I believe we're good. Thanks, Jess. Okay. Any qu <laughs> questions or comments in Silva? Yes, one. Hey, James, this is Walt. Hey, how you doing? Uh, yeah, how you doing? How about I'm doing good. Uh, you're talking about employer of record. You're talking about the family. Is the families? Is that sound like the same thing as the invasion for the family? Yeah, it's going to be pretty much the same thing as GT Financial. Uh, uh, so same. Okay. The employer of record. Are you coming into an audit yet or anything of that nature to see how? Because that's always been a question: is how the family prepare for the audit. Right now, it's being audited. <laughs> And at one point, they asked for agencies to volunteer, and my agency, along with some others, volunteered. And they found out they had about 800 to 1,000 kids in the pilot, and they said, oh, no, that's too much. Even though we want a statewide, so they kicked all the big ones out. They only wanted 150 kids. So there's no pilot in the West. It's ending at the end of July. Um, I have been promised by the director of this program that my agency will be in the first phase in. Um, but which will hopefully be October. I don't know more. We got a big training in July, July 29th, <laughs> about our changes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? Anything else in Silva? One thing that um, for being I could say is that we're, we're Kathy's doing screenings initially now, and. Uh, She's following, we'll be following up with James anytime she thinks that there's a possibility that the person meets the eligibility. Uh, so we're actually having the family follow up with James. So, anything else here in Asheville regarding CAPS? Any questions, comments? I've been trying to help, but we're trying to look into the preparation for the next book more eligible about CAPS. Just tell them to call. I mean, I don't think any agency will say that to. Um, we get calls.
laws and we can't do anything, and I'm referring to Smokey or FDA, um, I mean, that's the best thing, is just call it and, and let us spend the time to ask, and ask our questions and answer these. Yeah, because it's, it's a great resource for people. It's a great resource for us when we've got wait lists as long as we have. To be able to say, well, you can probably get into services this way. Maybe. And I'm for using every resource. Um, and we never really use this one enough. So, well, it used to be hard. It used to be harder because the other day they, they had the wait list and I tired of wait list.
about 12, typically 12 hours per day maximum, may receive 16 hours per day with prior approval for 90 to 180 day periods, depending upon circumstances. And a, a, a question I, not, I've got on that and then reading that one is that also is like in home intensive where you have to have a step down plan to, to go to other services. How do you step down personal care? Well, it, it was, that, that's, the, those are the questions that um, I was at a different thing Thursday and I was talking to some people about the confusion and things that don't make yeah. sense in that. And that's why you need to send an email to that comment line about the, how does this work because if you go to the limits on the sets of the service later in the waiver, it's the 84 hour limit and it's not clear how these match in any way. There's a lot in there that doesn't match. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And, um, but, but this service, the concept is it'll be a blended service. It replaces personal care, in-home skill building, and, and in-home uh, intensive supports. They're, each planning team will determine how much rehabilitation should be occurring and how much care should be occurring. And, these services too are proposed to be hourly units instead of 15 minute units so that you won't be necessarily getting services approved in 15 minute increments. Who will lead you to do your business? Yeah, I believe you're good. Right. Uh, I mean, you give us that, but what's the rate? Um, well, the rates haven't been set yet. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that uh, Cardinal. They changed the rate for their personal care in home skill building and in home intensive supports. All three of those services now pay $475 a unit. So they pre blended it kind of. They pre blended it as of January 1 this year. We saw the rate, they made it blended already. But that, that as you increase the rate, you increase the services. The, the, the number of hours. That's what it is. If you're getting close to the to the, uh, the cost, yeah, but, but you see, like this is on this service definition. The beauty about this for this meeting is this is where I say I can't fix anything. If y'all want something to change, you bombard them with emails. Uh, it doesn't always work, but it's, it, it's got more of a chance of. That's why I tell all the families. Yeah, do it. Send them out just blast them and choose. Uh, Jesse, can you clarify that? Four dollars and what a unit? Four seventy five a unit. And a unit is considered a unit? Fifteen minutes. So it's what? Uh, Nineteen dollars now a year. That cardinal. Mm -hmm. That cardinal. And that's just a cardinal rate. That's we think we call it a unit. Yes. Well, to an extent, but that, that doesn't. Not necessarily so much on rates and everything. They just took the step of blending their service rates because of discussion about blending the uh, three services, and they also made the decision that they wanted to move more towards outcomes and not not bicker over what's had and what's not. That you know that that age old debate. Uh, so. So those changes are there in that definition. Um, let's see, so I, I looked at two definitions so far. Anyone in Boone want to say anything? No. I already put them to sleep. Oh, yeah, I do have one comment. Before Mary does hers, I just want to take a chance to say hey to James Clay. I already haven't talked to him since my hair looked like Jesse's. Hey, James, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. It has been. Go ahead, Mr. Short. It looks like mine. The only comment I have, Jesse, for the group is um, 
that they can call Raleigh and get a printed copy of the proposed waiver mailed. And that phone number is 919-855-4290. Um, that information was confirmed by Renee Rader at DMA. She was the, um, I guess, admin aid person to the 1915C stakeholder group. So again, 919-855-4290. And you can request a printed copy because not everyone has email? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Mary? Yes. This is Kathy. I left, I left two messages out of that number. Yes. Um, asking for a copy and somebody to call me back to make sure they had my address right. And I started on the 23rd and I haven't gotten anybody to call me back. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, Renee, R E N N E. Mm -hmm. Dot Rader, R A D E R, mm -hmm. and then it's at that uh, the regular um, mm -hmm. DHHS dot NC dot gov. Is that her email address, Jesse? Yes, that's her email address. Mm -hmm. Did you get your copy, Mary, or did you? Uh, I have a I haven't called and requested a copy. No, I had somebody in Raleigh, I asked her to ask for it, and I haven't heard back from her. The fact that um, you don't have it, you meaning Smokey, didn't publicize that people could call and get a copy. Because when I initially contacted Renee about people who don't have internet access, and how were they supposed to look at this waiver and make comments, I had assumed that she was going to tell me that each of the LMEMCOs would have a printed copy available and people could go to the LMEMCO and look at the copy. So when she emailed me and said they would mail a copy to anybody who requested it, I was quite shocked. So apparently the only end as I've read the waiver document and the sections of the waiver that talks about what it is North Carolina did to get public input on the waiver, um, it's not clear about the fact that public input is only available to people with internet access. I mean, I, I didn't get a computer and, and internet service from Smokey. Did anybody else? Oh, that's right. You're supposed to go to the library. I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Um, let's look back to the service definitions. The major change in community guide. There's a change in the name to Community Navigator. As you know, there's some changes in language and such, and uh, so a Community Navigator. So that now we can confuse it with Community Networking, so it the acronyms are the same. Um, and, uh, you know, just my minor language changes. That's like, that's uh, and one thing that uh, was prevalent throughout the document that will have to be, uh, some of the services identify that the individual budget limit is a limit, and that will likely have to be removed from the document. Because it really, sh the only limits that exist in the waiver, should exist in the waiver, are the uh, limits on sets of services that are defined in Appendix C4 and the annual cost limit of 135000 a year. Uh, because you can't say, we can't say that the individual budget's a limit because in other places in the document it talks about the individual budget or the supports account, whatever it ends up being called. It talks about that as being a guideline and that it's not a hard limit. We can't make our decisions 
and utilization management based on that individual budget category. So most of the service definitions indicate that the individual budget would apply, but it can't. That would be fixed. That's exactly one of the smoky comments. Not all these services are part of the budget. Some of them don't affect the budget. Right. Like Navigator doesn't affect, Specialized Consultative doesn't affect. Right. Okay. But they all are part of the $135,000 budget. Okay. Or limit. Okay. Yeah, not the ones in that one. Let me snap them out. Right. Thank you. Yeah. It's just instead of snap. Can you clarify that? Say that again. It's just instead of snap? Okay. Is the limit on budget and the community networking is included in that? Well, the waiver as it is proposed has limits on sets of services, which are defined in Appendix C-4. Those are 84 hours per week of services for persons living at home, unless that number is exceeded by using in-home intensive supports right now. The other limit is like residential supports. A person receiving residential supports can receive 40 hours of periodic services, in addition to the daily residential supports, except for children in school. And they're limited to 20 hours a week during school. And like children in school that are living at home are also limited to 54 hours a week. Those are limits that are written in the waiver that are enforceable. And also, the other limit that exists in the waiver is the cost limit. And that's that $135,000 number. So you can't exceed either of those limits in the waiver. I just didn't think that the community networking or community guidance, I'm saying it wrong, community networking is a service. Community guidance is not supposed to be a part of the budget. Community guide is not a part of your, it's not a part of your self-directed individual budget, but it's still a part of the $135,000. So you get your budget allocation. Yeah, it's basically $900 a year. That's what the community guide is. Your individual budget allocation, you still can't go over $135,000. But we're not going to put it in the modifications, so that falls outside of the... The home modifications and stuff, that is the limit, the $50,000 limit on the two, and that's another limit that does exist that's a hard limit. And the $135,000 a year applies to those two. But that counts towards the $135,000, not towards the individual. Right. Jesse, out of everything within the waiver, and a lot of what we talked about doesn't affect your area, not that you're all changing, what's going to be the main change in all of this that could or might affect Jerry as far as the group home services he gets? Anything? Yeah, let me get to that. Let me get on through the services, and I'll touch on what's going to impact group aggregate living. For congregate living, not aggregate. So the community transition service doesn't change very much. Crisis services, there's some significant changes in this that should increase the use of crisis services because it's going to allow billing by QPs that have experience with IDD, as long as they're supervised by licensed clinicians with regard to crisis. Right now, we're limited in what we can do with certain crisis behavior consultation because we don't have enough licensed staff with the expertise. But if you use QPs that are supervised by licensed staff or have access to licensed staff, it increases the availability of that service. Day supports, there's changes in language, and it will be impacted by the home community-based service standards, which I'll touch on. Just changes in language and financial services. The major change in home modification is that the more flexibility in the list 
Really? It's no longer exhaustive. It's the same medical uh, necessity. Argument is that equipment. And there's some exclusions, but they're really limited. <laughs> Individual goods and services, more changes in language. Same with natural supports education. Attempts to make things make more sense. Residential supports changes in that uh, respite's going to be allowed in AFLs, both licensed and non-licensed AFLs. Uh, it will be part of the limits on sets of services. So if a, if a residential supports provider wants, uh, say the person's been going to a day program 32 hours a week, they would be eligible to get eight hours of respite a week. So, or they could just go to the day program, not go to the day program at all, and get 40 hours of rest per week. So it's 40 hours of outside services, mm -hmm. and respite is now one of those. Respite is one of those outside okay. services. So you know, we're giving respite. Right. And, and supported employment. And supported employment. Okay. And day supports. It's pretty much you can get 40 hours, and then the levels are going to be determined by individual budgeting table category. And there's seven seven different table or seven different categories in the individual budgeting, which we'll get a lot more into that as we move forward. Um, the level one is categories A and B. Most of our folks are going to fall in two and three, uh, and quite a few in four. But it's not going to be tied to a SNAP index score anymore. Um, but tied to this is. Yeah, it's tied to the citizen of the category. So that you say seven categories, are there going to be seven budget categories on the other, you know, with the... Yes, there will be seven. There will actually be 28 different budget categories. <laughs> so how is not the budget categories? A thousand dollars? No, it's because the budget categories are broken up into several different age groups. You have children living at home, children living in residential placement, yeah. adults living at home, mm -hmm. and adults living in residential placement. Those are your four age groups, and then there's seven categories for each age group. Okay, that makes sense. And we will be getting into lots of detail about this as we go forward, because we'll be reaching out to y'all to help us determine that's why we're changing community guide to community navigate, right? Because by raising the reading level, it's easier to make people understand. Well, we're about to help people find their way, not leave them. So maybe um, we're reaching So when we got that, and in specialized consultation, there's some changes that increase it, that may increase the use. Uh, Support employment, more just changes in language and clarity. There's a new service added called Support Living. And this service is to target people that live in their own homes, not family homes. They either have to own the home or lease the home. Uh, and it's a 24-hour service. Uh, that, that's a question I've got unless it's changed. I was always told the CAP Innovation is just not. 24 hour visit service. Now it is under a certain service definition, but it's not under other service definitions. Is that correct? Uh, that's just discrimination. If that's the case, it's under not the support. It's under not having a It's a 24 hour billing period. Right. So it's a daily service. But if they lived in their own place, if they live in their own place, they're still going to have to have some time when they don't have necessarily staff. And there will be adjustments. I'm not going to need staff. Um, well, it, 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 it's going to depend on each individual. But let's just say, even though it's a daily service, 40 hours of it a week can be for other periodicals. <laughs> so. Right, so they don't release their home and they live with the bums. Somebody's got to help take care of them because if they 
Well, and, and it's defined as 24-hour flexibility in responding to the needs of the participant. So, so it's not 24-hour service. Mm -hmm. It's like you have a personal care, so living a little bit of personal care and other stuff, you have coverage for your day. Mm -hmm. The times you need it. And the daily rates, about an hourly rate. And it gives you that opportunity with technical support that's available to control things like stoves, ovens, things like that, and you can do it. Well, I, I can sleep in my home, I don't need somebody, to, I can sleep all night. So I can live in my own place. I don't want to see this system. That's what we're looking at. It goes all the way down to level, level three. It does, and it has level three. So that seems to be really looking at how it's safety. That's what I'm saying, yeah. So to show you how the ritual can do it. We'll see how that does work out. Um, let's see, vehicle mods, there's not a lot of changes to it except increased clarity. Uh, there was no changes to the standard staff requirements. Uh, the relative is direct support employee as it's proposed in the document. Changes to where up to 40 hours per week must be reported to the MCO, but it doesn't have to be approved by the MCO. Uh, then more than 40 hours, up to 56 hours, requires approval by the MCO. And with the total number of hours one relative may provide, regardless of the number of participants in the home, is 56 hours per week. And the language also states that relatives providing greater than 56 hour limit may continue if it is participant choice, there are no health and safety issues and the participant is not isolated. So basically any circumstance where the relative is direct service employee is providing more than 56 now could be grandfathered in by what's being proposed. Um, Sorry, I've got that alarm thing. Oh, but, but you've got the battle of the new ones because the old ones are grandfathered in. Such a waste of time. Why? So, yeah. Well, you don't have a. Uh, you wouldn't even have a battle of the new ones if it's up to 40. Because yeah. it's just notified from the MCO. Um, let's see. And then the uh, resource allocation, we've already touched about that. That's. Uh, the categories will be based on six scores. And each category will be defined. The base budget services will be community networking services, day supports, community living support, residential supports, supported living, respite, support employment. And then the uh, non base budget services, which will be treated like add ons or things that you get that don't count against your individual budget category, are uh, technology and equipment. Community guide, community transition services, crisis services, financial support services, individual goods and services, home mods, natural sports education, specialized consultation services, and vehicle mods. So, so the major changes in this waiver are the addition of supported living, the uh, move to resource allocation and the blended service. Now, getting back to Nancy's question about how this affect Jerry, well, he's living in a congregate arrangement with six people, or five other people. <laughs> and the part of the waiver that's going to impact him is already underway, and that's the uh, home and community-based service standards. And that's an integral part of the waiver that's required by CMS, and we've talked about it some in here. This is the uh, transition plan that started in January of 2014 when CMS declared their final rule. North Carolina submitted the first parts of their transition plan in March of this year, and we have until March of 2019 to be in compliance with the home and community-based service standards. Um, places that are going to have the greatest challenge in meeting the HCBS standards are 
six bed group homes, mm -hmm. our day supports programs, or any of the congregate places. Uh, so, the move towards those standards will impact Jerry in some way, and anybody that lives in those settings because uh, Good. the coordinators and the providers are going to have to pay much closer attention to client rights, to uh, choice, and those kind of things. So, like right now, um, we're about to roll out the statewide self assessment of HCDS. The trainings are going to be able to set up today, and the self assessment will be posted on July 15th. And providers, we're asking a lot of providers because they get two months to complete this assessment on every site where they provide residential supports, day supports, or supported employment. And uh, we have to get that assessment information from them. And if they feel that they're not meeting certain criteria, they tell us that they're not with a plan of action. The thing we use is the greatest examples, whether or not uh, keys. Does Jerry have a key to his house? And his room. And his room. And one to his room, but not to the house. We'll see, he should have one to the house, according to HCS, since he knows how to use the key. <laughs> so, so the, those are the things that you have to ask and discuss. But you, can put, you can put restrictions. Of it. Yeah, you can have restrictions, but that's that's just an example of. Can you paint his own room? They choose the colors. And, yeah, but, but but those are the kind of things you'll be looking at as we go forward. How is this um, going to affect? A provider like Monarch who basically doesn't have a heck of a whole lot of these anymore, but just has the one in the county, well, I guess they have two in the county. So is this going to end up impacting them enough that they would just finally say, it's not worth it to me? Mm -hmm. Besides the Monarch is, no. Don't bet on that, Jesse. <laughs> On any of the um, definitions or things that you brought up? Yeah. I, I mean, you sort of ran through, what, six or eight of them before you asked? Um, and I... Uh, I'm sorry, because most of them, there's no changes. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, I know what it was. The supported uh, living... Um, how is, uh, so is, is that staff going to be standby staff? Mm. Mm. I mean, if they have to respond, so if they're standby staff, are they paid? Uh -huh. means that there would be a response in some way. Like, it may not be an immediate no, no, no. response. It may take 15 to 30 minutes, like any uh, one else that was to have an accident in their home and make a call, or the home would likely have some type of technology so that staff would know that a person's getting up and doing something they really shouldn't be doing, and that would prompt a sensor mm. to go off, mm. and there would probably be maybe one staff monitoring five or six locations. Well, I just wondered. I mean, we're not covered by the FLSA right now, but that doesn't mean we won't be. And 
you know, that sort of standby availability is going to cost the provider. You might not be able to bill Medicaid for it, but it's going to cost the provider. Just saying. No. Other programs added to that, like they support community networking. They're not. Well, we do have technology in this way. So if we want to access something through somebody home, right. so you can right. launch those, control elements for those things. I mean, it's being done with senior citizens. Yeah. No. This is a. They're not facing addressing to internet services and telephone services. I mean, that's what's mm -hmm. coming out with the budget. To do that, so yes, we could use the supported equipment, but you've got to have you have to pay for your own internet, you have to pay for your own phone line. And that's the end of it, all it's doing, man. You have one anyway. That's yeah. no, I'm not sure. You really don't. You can do your network at $1,000. I think, uh, Let's I have see. to look, and I'm not, but I think that if you're using certain connectivity for uh, managing independence that certain monthly fees are covered. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't hold me to that. I know it was discussed. Not before. Not no, it wasn't before, but I think that's something that's changing in this waiver because that was part of our discussions. You have to have certain, you have to have connectivity to use technology. Some of it, especially the monitoring stuff. And a lot of folks can't afford that connectivity. Now, now it's not meaning you're going to get anything beyond like basic internet, but for that sake, it's just kind of a loaded question that you're going to love. How 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 friendly is the NCO toward these service definitions? How friendly? Yeah, I mean, how 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 much do you how much does the NCO agree with them?
until it's 9 30 and then leave and come back. It's like, okay, I'll cover you up to hours, but that doesn't necessarily mean somebody's got to be there. And if we got it, it's a little bit easier to understand and count hours than it is units because you don't have to do everything in multiples of four. Would there be more flexibility to the weekly schedule? Yes, yes. That, that's, that, that's behind this. And, and uh, like when we're talking about trying to put some things together, it's going to to get really out in front of this and make it as user friendly as possible. And, and that's what we'll be talking about a lot more of that stuff with this group as we more closely find this group because we've got to tie this group closer to CFAC and, and make it much more. Uh, um, system wide impact. And I need to go back to some other. Wendy's reminded me that um, I'm running off with the mouth because I feel like I can move really fast in my new shoes. Um, so I need to ask uh, Boone if there's any thoughts. Hey, Jess, this is Roger. Uh, the phase thing in does. All services available January 1st will be phased in on their ISP calendar year. That's a good question. The way the waiver is written, uh, in-home skill building, in-home intensive supports, and personal care all end on December 31st, 2015 and are replaced by the uh, community Living and supports or community sports and living, which is it? Mm -hmm. That's you know, that supported living, community supports and living. There's a problem there. <laughs> community living and supports. But, but, I, but I'll caution you that that's that's what's written in this waiver, uh, and that it will be dependent upon the date that it goes into effect. But since they are eliminating those services and creating a new service. That we have to mandate those the date that the waiver goes effective. So that means that because there will be a change in rates, um, therefore a change in budgets, that there will have to be revisions to everybody's plan that has those. Who doesn't have one of those? Sorry. <laughs> Everybody's got to we know what the rate is. I mean, you're going to make a comment on something. If I don't want that makes you feel pain. You can't sell the rate until you set the definition. The and, and if you say that, that's uh, going back to like, that's where you express that you're very concerned about the possibility that the rate will not be sufficient. Yeah, because if I don't know if your rate will really stack, then you can find how much you give me. And then that's the, the more she concerns about the rates being sufficient. And avoided service. Um, are there any other thoughts in the room, Michael? Casey, I have another question. Alan, I'm okay. Okay. What you're saying here, the proposal is that the blended services, when in all instances, replace, in other words, you're not going to have the road blended services anymore at all with the habilitative and the personal care. Is that sometimes or is that always the blended service? It would always be the blended service. Except unless you're like, oh, we're just talking about those three that become that one service. Right. And the, uh, the person's plan would identify when they're trained and when they're doing personal care, but you wouldn't be arguing that point with utilization management. Two uh, questions about uh, just some language. One is in the day supports definition under exclusion. Um, it says residential support. Uh, since that's a 24 hour service, is that just like, I mean, is that a language technicality that's in there? I mean, people are getting that for hours. It's under, it's under day supports or uh, residential supports? It's under day supports, under exclusions. It says may not be provided at the same time as, and then it lists the services out. It says residential supports, and since that is a 24 uh, hour service, and we have folks, is that just a language thing that it should is, be? Uh, when, is yeah. when a person's receiving residential supports, they're allowed to receive up to 40 hours of other periodics. 
but you can't build the residential supports at the same time as the day supports. Even though it's a daily service, it's one of those confusing things that always exists in waivers. It's a, it's a daily service that's built daily, and you just can't have your residential supports work for providing services at the same time your day supports worker is. Not that you ever would. Right. And then the other question is, is actually under residential supports, under the changes, it says it cannot be provided by a relative. Are we defining relative as what the state defines that as? Because there are some rare instances out there where there's a maybe an uncle who has been appointed a guardian that wasn't the natural home of the person and they are providing a residential setting. We need to be changing those types of settings and we need to be doing them now. We're looking no, you don't need to change anything now because I believe that that's an oversight in the waiver. Okay. But we do need to let them know that. Yeah. <laughs> you, need to, you need to ask questions and make comments about that because I think that they just failed to check that box. And, and there's a way around it anyway. If relative is defined as uh, uh, parents, that parents, adopted parents, and, and that may be the case, there, there's two ways around it. So. Even if the box isn't checked, it wouldn't change our interpretation of ants providing services as residential supports. <laughs> Anything else? <to> <coughs> that was an echo. Did you hear that? I must be talking too loud. <laughs> Any thoughts on Silva? Uh, Jesse, this is Walter. On the, uh, you're talking about the parents' direct support. How do they get the, uh, the Department of Labor 40 hours a week as for a job? Because I can see where that having more than 40 hours a week could cause a problem with the Department of Labor for provider agents. Is mm -hmm. there a way they're around that now, getting around that now, or what are they doing? They're approving more than 40 hours a week. doing all those 40s. You'll have plenty of staff time. If you're providing personal care, it is exempt for overtime. Personal care is exempt for overtime? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right now it's a blended service. But you have to be living in the home with the person. Oh, okay. Yeah. But there's no more service like there with the blended That's service. That's not true. So is it still fuzzy? You don't have to be living at home. I am, that's why I 
about this here. Everything I'm saying is coming to me too. I'm too tired to think, but I can still read. Do you ever see with everything that's coming down, and I know they're doing more with everybody's rights, Like where Jerry is in the sixth bed, do you ever see them making that be broken up mm -hmm. less than the six? Like my heart would have to separate it out. The girls in one place and boys in another by the end of the We haven't allowed a new six bed element of the state to provide waiver services since 2001. Yeah, I knew you hadn't. And because of the uh, we haven't licensed six bed homes since 2001 as for residential supports. And CMS has a limit of four beds mm -hmm. on their congregate arrangements. The reason we have the home and community based service transition plan is because states have not transitioned away from six bed homes since 2001. Because mm -hmm. the 2001 waiver had the expectation. If we start moving away, I bet like eventually it does happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not going to happen. And it was just to make the moves on its own, it's going to be forced to do it. And I won't be surprised to see the but institutions. The other thing is that now the state, state, the state is licensing four bed AFLs yeah. instead of three bed. I mean, they, they will go up to four now. Mm -hmm. So they're increasing the size of those. Yeah, but just. Uh, uh, they're decreasing everything else. But like New York's closing a lot of ISD up in West Virginia. Well, Tennessee as well. We have three in this state. We have 400 beds in the whole state of New York. Yeah. So, so, so that's the direction we're going. So they said it years ago, they them all. So. <laughs> but people who are in there require more than 12 hours a day of services. Hello. They've got to go someplace other than home, which is where they might like to be. But to be able to find that one-on-one -on -one service level, you can't you can't make enough money as a provider doing one-on-one -on -one in a three or a four bed facility. Well, I don't think the blood people living in ICFMR actually need 24/7 care. They're just there, and that's what they've been. It's the lowest common denominator. Oh God. West Virginia 92, and they were closing down. They were way ahead of North Carolina. They were shutting down their ICF their boxes. And that opening, you had to take less than two people in the home, and they're all closed. So it is success for the people at home, with the employees in the small communities, but the people who were there were able to move out into those communities. So if it's possible in West Virginia, it's possible for Because I know what he's talking about. One of the things that I hear you say under KFC, and I know to be true under, under innovations, is there's not enough staff to staff these people. What's happening at DMA or what are people doing to try to not a thing bring all these people out when you can't staff the people that are already out? Well, what's, what's what's you can't staff them in the air house. You can make $13 an hour. Yeah. Uh, and, and getting them out of the air house. Exactly. Uh, uh, mm. Getting them in a trolley and they don't seem to have a shortage. Mm. Maybe there is. But it's community. I, I think about one of them, we got shortages. Mm. We're getting people filled. Swain County, we're getting we'll get staff. And that's not what County is an issue. Mm. 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 M
think about, okay, how can I make this thing work? They're not going to make all the changes anybody wants. So think about it. What is it that keeps you from actually doing what they say they want to do? And then how do I manipulate and make it work for me? Supervisor living was supportive living. I think it was back in 97. We had three levels. Yeah. And the level one was four hours, and level two was five to six. And, and guess what phases <laughs> fade out in case they just help? Was we could make agencies commit, compete. And so maybe I was level one, but I should have got my five to six hours at eight hours a day. You know that the, the, the flexibility, maybe they may not, make a particular flexibility and don't get blocked into it's always been this way, or we always have to have 24 hour service, or because supervised living seems like a typical service, but how do I make it work with all the other things? Well, this technology. And don't get caught up in anything else. Ah. And, and Make a plan and then pick the service package. These services can work, but you got to get away from rates. And, and don't, they're not going to determine rates until all this stuff is in place. And then you have rate setting, and then the MCOs will take that and do their own. What about the people change? What happens to that? They may not be able to live in a supervised living. I mean, not everybody can do it. They wouldn't be able to live in a supervised living, possibly, but there are mechanisms for us to go in excess of the individual budget. We can't exceed the 135,000. Mm -hmm. We're not serving anyone in the state with over 135,000 on our waiver now. So <coughs> most of the time we can meet the person's needs in that number. Because that's uh, roughly one, oh, that's 113% of the ICF rate. Um, so, can I say one quick go around? Any any other thoughts in Silva? No? James, okay. This is right. And I got something. Okay. Uh, is, is Smokey looking to do anything with the College of Directors kind of stuff where they're talking about educating workers? so that they actually have some type of uh, certificate or training in regards to how to deal with people in the community and work with people. Are they talking about that in Smoky? I know they were talking about it at the state level and then kind of went to the MCOs and I haven't heard anything else about it. We, we are talking internally about that right now. And that will be some of our waiver discussions with the new waiver and what to do. And I know there's been quite a bit of discussion about it regarding employer record and it being a mechanism for those staff to more easily share. Um, okay, anything else in Silva? <coughs> we'll go to Blue. Mm -hmm. Got anything yeah. else for us, Mike? Um, I don't have nothing, but I'll make it quick. But, uh, <laughs> I don't think that whatever whatever's going on in the, the labor services should be turning turn it in all all Google make it Google the right way if you get it. Mm. If you get what I'm saying, yes. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I do. We should be working to make it go in the right direction. Right? Is that what you're trying to tell me? That's what I'm that's what I'm trying to tell you, but it don't always do. It don't, because I know you're out there working your head off of me. I'm sorry, 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 i uh, with the College of Direct Support, mm -hmm. are they looking at that? Is Smoky looking at that as a supplemental training mm -hmm. to core competencies that the provider agencies utilize currently or as a replacement? Mm -hmm. I think we're not far enough for me to answer that question. We're, we're reviewing it and looking at it as an option uh, along with the uh, National Alliance Direct Support Professionals. That group that's looking at creating 
something similar to what you have with CNAs to where the employees can get a credential that they carry with them from provider to provider so that certain trainings aren't required by the provider. So it would be a savings for the provider in some ways. Mm. And it would, re it, it would mm. replace anything that the provider does um, that's their own policy. But it would be something that would have the person follow with CPR, first aid, the things that are easily easy to follow them. Maybe even four confidences. Mm. But keep in mind that if you go down that road, you don't want it to become that you only can do services if you have been through that. Right. Or you do run into you don't have the staff and you have a bigger shortage. So it's good for people who want to make a degree. But they can't have it. It has to be an option. They want compensation for spending the time and money. Yeah, it has to be an option. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, can't really answer anything beyond what we've said. said right. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
And, and it's either got to got to be filled by a volunteer, or if, if if there's not a volunteer, then then what? So people who actually require actually require an ICFIDD level of care. They don't receive innovation services. They go to ICF IDDs. Yeah. Even Katie seems to understand, Jesse. That's a little scary. Well, actually, mm -hmm. every ICF IDD I've ever been in yeah. just has two staff at night for six people, mm -hmm. sometimes two staff for eight. So it's not one-on-one, 24-7. Hey, Jerry, they only have one. Yeah, one for six, but he's not in ICF. He's in a residential yeah. But even in money follows the Jesse, even with money follows the person, 30% of the people who apply for money follows the person can't get out because they don't have that 12 hour a day volunteer. So I, I'm just trying to understand if you're going to have these budget. But they want out to the family home. And you have 30% who couldn't get out because of the limits on sets of service. Because it's getting offensive. My niece is 28, 30 years old, oh, God. living with family. They are not mm. volunteers. They don't say they are volunteering 12 hours a day with her. That is their family member. And if you keep saying it's a volunteer, maybe for you, but it's offensive as hell for those who don't see it that way. And I apologize for my language, but it is offensive, okay? I don't volunteer when I go spend time with my niece. And so please understand that. Not everybody agrees. We understand where you stand, but there's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of families that don't have the depth of support. There isn't some miracle long line of family willing to do what family does. Okay. Um, we've reached the point where we probably should end this meeting. I have a question. Um, before we do, I'm sorry. I, mean, I was waiting until you went around the thing and, and came back to us. I was trying to be good and not interrupt. Um, we can talk about residential supports and the need to be um, accredited in or added to our services, crisis services, so that oh, we can right. do that. And that is a big change. That's right. It's the addition of crisis service. You need to be enrolled in crisis services so that you can be the first oh. responder, basically, for the residential oh. supports. Place. That's right. And if you are enrolled to do it, oh. you have to have an agreement with a provider that can do it. That's just about for all services. Mm. So to get um, mm -hmm. whatever for crisis services, then you have to have a, a queue that's trained, mm -hmm. or you have a psychiatrist, or you have a no, or you don't have mm -hmm. to have all that for the first level crisis services, not the provider level of crisis services. Okay. That, that, that's where you you have not gotten in all that document, that brief document I said. I didn't get into the details of each different provider type. So, so it, it's really not that large a change. It's just saying you either have to do it or you have to have someone who's going to do it. And they, they put it in the actual document instead of just in the, the manual. But it will cause additional enrollment no matter what. <laughs> yeah, you will have to, you have to enroll in crisis services if you contract with somebody else to do it. Mm. If you make an agreement with another provider in your area to do mm. a 24-hour call. Mm. Is there a feeling for the, do you feel separately for the crisis codes, or we're saying as, you're, as the provider, your first responder duty is to be first responder, or, or mm. I'm sorry that I don't know this, are we saying that as a first responder, you still need crisis codes? Well, we're building in the crisis codes so that they have a mechanism to pay for the first response. Okay. That, that, that's why it's your benefit to add it. So
so that if you have a crisis, you can get paid to respond. So that's really a benefit. Thank you. Your question actually helped clarify. The amount of rope you go to get your feet and get a rope. So, we will wrap it up. Our next meeting will be August 24th. At that meeting, Tracy Hayes will go over the Cardinal Settlement. Excellent. A presentation about due process and participant rights. I'd like to thank James for his presentation. I think we all learned something. And as a reminder, most of what's in this waiver document, well, there's this, I really like this story about where the Dugville platypus came from. And I'm going to share it just because it's kind of entertaining. There's this story that basically God decided to take Sunday off and he turned the creation of the Dugville platypus over to a committee. And that's why you have a man with a duck spiel. That's what our waiver is, because it's people coming together and putting something, trying to come to agreement on different things. And that 200-page, 202-page document is far from perfect. It has lots of stuff in it that doesn't make sense and is redundant. But it's really the first time that there was a lot of collaborative input on the front end of the development, whether it's good or bad. And now it's posted for your opportunity to make a comment. And you can also get a paper copy. You have to call and ask for it. If you're not having any luck getting a hold of folks, email me, and I'll also email Renee and press that issue. But... Or call you if they don't have access to internet. Right. Or call. And make your comments to that email address. One thing that often happened in the Western Highlands area was we always got more comments than anyone else. So... Can you do that? We might, from the West, we might as well share what we think. Might not do any good, but share it anyway. Can we have a B3 discussion at the August meeting? Are y'all going to be ready to give a share of information? Can't do both. We can't share information about B3. B3 and Tracy. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And we will expect a number of emails over the next few weeks as things continue to roll out because there's a lot going on in the system right now. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.